I would like you to take take it from 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 the from the time I to the to the from the, from your arrest and then go into the prosecution. But before you do that, I have a, another question for you. Why did you think Fallon did not address that thing? I mean, that why did he not read the new social order as 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 agreed? I can only conjecture. Um, some would say, oh, it's cowardice. It's part, maybe partly that. But the problem is that by that time, Fulon had all types of problems on him. Fulon started when Ajijo was gone. Fulon was the sole non Bororo who was piping the virtues of Ahijo. Spent his time writing in the, in the press about how good Ahijo was. Just at the time when the people were demonizing, Bia's regime was now to demonize Ahijo. So before he realized, you see, the, the special situation he had in the times of Ahijo, where he had a whole um, uh, newspaper, I've forgotten what it is, a newspaper, the Abia. He was writing there. He hardly wrote anything against the government. He hardly showed, brought out the issues which, which were facing the place. And so there was some type of understanding. You, intellectual, engage these intellectuals in this type of uh, uh, social matters and leave us to do the politics. Now, Ahijo had left, and Fonlon now was now trying to go into politics at a time when nobody wanted to hear the word Ahijo. So, all of a sudden, they said Fonlon that he was to be retired. He and Basimanga, they made sure they named Basimanga along with him. They were to be retired from university. I think they gave them that three months notice for retirement. It wasn't up to a month, they changed it and said his retirement has taken immediate effect. Fulon was no longer receiving a salary. Ahijo had agreed that Fulon can buy the government house where he was. The people reversed that. And uh, when I realized that this man was no longer... Uh, in fact, I was used to bring money to Fulon and food. When I heard that they had reduced this thing to a they had immediately they had stopped it. I had to go to Foshive. I said, Foshive, are you people crazy? You have given a notice to Mbasimanga and Fonlon. That's what the university has done. What is wrong? Why have they decided to shorten Fonlon's own uh, notice? Mbasimanga is receiving his salary waiting for the three years. You people have cut down for non uh, for So it was three years, not three months. Three years. Okay. You cut down for non's own. Why? I'm going to create trouble here if you if you don't if you don't change this. So Foshive had to go to the minister uh, to the uh, function public. Who is Foshive? Foshive, that was a, like our CIA head of the CIA in Cameroon. He had to go to uh, to um, um, the function public. To reverse the decision back to the three years, but they were still not giving him salary. So, with all those in, uh, Fondon was now trying to endear himself now to this regime, okay, so that they can leave him alone. That's your speculation about that. It. Is my speculation. That was that is my speculation, and I don't think I blame him. Yeah, I mean, we have a country where. Even if Fonlon took up that situation, people were going to be looking just as Fonlon rather than the principles which he was stating there. That's like our people. So um, that, that is my understanding about why. Because we were still friends after that. When we left, in fact, that document enabled him and Paul Songu to be renamed in the political bureau. Because they had told Professor Ngu, 
it is finished with him. Fonlon was to go. But this new social order showed that the Anglophones were going to go up in arms if this, these two icons were also thrown out. That's why they put them back in the, in the, uh, uh, the executive or social bureau, I mean the political bureau of the, the new thing that they, they formed, the CPDM. Okay, um, let's continue with, uh, let's, let's continue from when you were arrested. All right. Um, I was arrested and they put me uh, in a place where they say it was the, whether the Cartier Central, it was the a police uh, cell. It was a small cubicle, I think about eight feet uh, long, with about uh, four feet wide. It was a bare floor, cement, wet, dirty even. That was where I was to lie down. That was, on, it thought was to be my dining table and also my toilet. And all this for writing the, the letter to the time major? Yes, now that is it. Because I wrote this thing there, get out of our country, implement your law to the, to the, to the fullest. Your law says there's a Republic of Cameroon, keep your country out of our country. That's what the Republic of Cameroon means. So, I felt very sick. I had to send for a bucket where I was um, uh, urinating and poo pooing. Uh, and then somebody will take it out and they will dump it somewhere and bring it back to me. The conditions were such that made me very, very sick. And they got frightened. So they took me to the uh, hospital. Fortunately, I uh, met Kathleen Gu, who was a family friend. She's a specialist in cardiology. And uh, I was praying I should get, meet somebody who at least knows me. So when I just got there, Kathy, I saw Kathleen passing. I said, Kathleen, Kathleen. She turned around and looked at me and said, Goji, why are you looking so miserable? I said, I'm coming from the police cell. She said, my goodness. Why? What are you doing there? I said, these people here are police people. I said, she refused even to, to put a stethoscope on my body. I am admitting you. And this happened to be a white woman. An English girl. If it was a, a Cameroonian, they would have ignored. You see how God operates? This was a white girl. I am admitting you. Do you have any money? I say, I have some money here. Pay for admission. Have, he had been admitted. So they took me back to go and get permission to follow what the doctor had said. Eventually, they brought me back there. But I had one... Um, ward with three beds. I sleep in the middle, armed somebody on the right in the other bed, armed somebody on this and the others on the ground there. And they would, every eight hours a new set would come and change. By the time I went there, even when I was still in that uh, place there, my friends had approached uh, a doctor from our own area, from my own tribe, and asked him, why don't you intervene on, on the, and use the health to get Fondinka out of there? What that doctor says is that Fondinka, it's about time he gets what he, what he, 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 he needs. He can't get away with this, he cannot get away with it. He wrote the other one, he cannot get away with this. So the people, my friends now, managed to send me a letter using toilet paper, that don't you take a tablet from Dr. XYZ. So when I was sick then, unfortunately when I was sick I was sick and uh, Catley admitted me, this doctor was the second in command, cardiac specialist too. 
Um, but he cared, never came anywhere near where I was. And that was my countryman. Which now confirmed what my friends had told me. You would expect other people came to console me, some people who were not even doctors, people were coming and visiting me. He never did. Uh, I don't think I was there for up to about three weeks. They were sending me tablets. The tablets were being prescribed, of course, through the, uh, the nurses. But I made sure I never took any. When they bring me the tablets, I'll keep them. When they are gone, I put them up in, in the, in the wash and basin and flush them away. Information had gone, and this palm owner had told the president that, you know, Dinka is a man who is given to insanity. What he has said, not one man is behind him. It's, in, it's an insane delusion. Now, it appears that they now wanted to confirm it by trying to make me insane. The tablets they have been sending to me apparently were not working, so they suspected I was throwing them away. Because those tablets, I believe they were intended to make me insane. That's why they decided that I should be transferred to Santri Jomo, which is a place for mad people. There they medicate by injection. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but the doctor who admitted me was Katli. Katli Ngu. So, Katli Ngu called me to a closed circuit television, was monitoring my heart, and then telling me that she is under pressure to transfer me from there to saint I said, Kathleen, you need a doctor to check your head. Why is transferring me to a mad people's place? He said, no, it's because there's where I don't want to send you back to, this, to the cell. There's where you can be there for as long as you want. They said, here, I'm occupying too much space. So I said, do you have any friends? in that uh, Santri Jamo. She said, no. I said, but who is the one arranging this thing? He named the doctor to me. And it turned out to be the doctor they told me I should not take a tablet from. My goodness. I knew how Kathleen would react if I told Kathleen what I knew about that doctor. So I said, like, Kathleen, this is Friday. Give me till Monday to give my answer. It's all right. By Monday, I come for my answer. So I went to back to my bed, and uh, that Friday night, the, it was Saturday. For the first time, that doctor, Kathleen, was not on duty. That doctor passed by and just looked at me. I greeted him in country talk, he just nodded his head and passed. Um, um, yes. Then, that Saturday night, for some reason, a note was laid on my bed. Please, with effect for midnight Sunday. Every midnight, sleep under your bed. Because there is going to be a commando operation to get you out of here. And it's going to be bloody. Who wrote this thing? I don't know. I asked the gendarm, I said, you who brought this paper here? He said, they don't, they don't know how the paper got there. They themselves forgot it. Somebody came and gave it to them. They put it, gave it to me. I said, they're going to kill people here because of me. How am I going to do? My friend, I prayed every hour. Every hour, I asked God, please get me out of here. If you know going to Santo Jamo is going to endanger my life, get me out of here. 11.30 a.m. on Sunday, my father, the Holy Spirit reincarnated, whom I am worshipping, appeared in front of me. 
get up and get out. My question was, I am now in pyjamas. Hospital pyjamas. I cannot go out of here in hospital pyjamas. I have got to change. When I start changing, these people are going to grab me. So how can I get out of here? I say, anyway, since they say I'm a madman, I will start changing. When they come and hold me, they say, oh, actually, this man is mad. How, what is he changing clothes for? But, Austin, I changed, took off my pyjamas, put aside, changed my ordinary clothes, passed, the people gave me away, I passed out of that uh, ward, out of the pavilion, out of the prison, took I mean, out of the uh, hospital premises, took a taxi straight to the British ambassador's residence. First, after landing at Asanga's place, Asanga was surprised. He said, what? I said, I have escaped. Take me to the British ambassador's residence. So he took me in his car and went there. About 1.30, Grace Jopakaba brought food to give me in the hospital. She came and waited. He said, me, ask them, where is this uh, man? That is the time they realized I had gone. Me, ili tela, ili tela. Me, who is killing? That is the time they gave a signal. In fact, they nearly arrested Grace. Grace said, but I'm the one asking where is the man. You say, no, you must know where he is. Um, there was this uh, Joe, uh, Nentang uh, Joa. He also came to visit me. They, uh, they arrested him. And um, some other people were coming to visit me. So the information said, no, but if you go to visit this man, you'll be arrested. People were running away because they didn't understand what was happening. Why, why were they arresting them? They are coming to visit somebody there. So, um, while I was the British uh, ambassador, I asked the man for political asylum. The man said, oh, no, 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 no. We only give asylum for people who are under persecution. I said, yes, I am being persecuted. He said, no, this is a law-abiding country. It's a law-abiding country, and there's no such thing as persecution. I refuse. I said, all right, Your Excellency, you are refusal. I appeal against your refusal to the Queen. The man said, well, it must be in writing. I said, bring me paper. So, he brought paper, started trying to take my, my particulars. I gave him my name. That's your profession. I gave him, oh, so you are a lawyer? I said, not only a lawyer, but the only QC in this country. What QC? Queen's Council. I said, the only person authorized by the Lord Chancellor of, of Britain to wear silk. This man broke down. He realized who he was talking with. But with a type of glossy duplicity which was, with which they are experts, he told me it's all right. He has spoken to the presidency. Everything will be fine and so on. And maybe they deceived him. I don't know. But this man got his own staff to come and take me and hand back to the police. One of the staff was the first secretary, K, a girl we knew who was friendly with us, phone and so on. I was taken back to the police. At this time, they took me to the uh, maximum security on the day. BMM, the torture house. That's how I got there. And then it's there that I wrote the revolt of Amazonia. How I wrote it was, I told them, uh, Biaka, who was the commissioner for that uh, BMM, I said, Biaka, this thing that they put me here, I would like to apologize to the head of state for this, uh, the things I wrote. So get me, I would like to put everything in writing and apologize to him. So he went to the presidency. I told them that I made drink I would demand pardon. So they said, all right, 
how do you see once some to type so they came to me i, I named one uh beacon boy who was used, used to type for me uh john Kuo. you should go and bring him they brought me a typewriter john Kuo was there and within a couple of days i produced the revolt of ambazonia gave it to him smuggled a copy through john who took it to university and within the next day there were 500 copies around the place this man took it to the uh, the presidency. He let the man they down. So they took it and gave it for translation. After they translated it, they, they called him. Read the translation of this. Is that what you call pardon? What I wrote there was worse than what I had written before, before they brought me in. What did you write? I was showing how this is a totally different... Um, uh, we are a different country from them. I analyzed, analyzed that. Like the situation in Switzerland, there's a confederacy there because there's Italian, Switzerland, there is a German, there's French. You don't merge these people together. The French, um, the, the, the Swiss uh, federal government, the presidency is by rotation, six, six months. So everybody has his autonomy. That's why we should be. I brought out everything. I said this, they, whether they like it or not, there is a revolt in place and it's going to end up with our success. So Biaka came back. He said, call me to the office. He said, Maitre, to my trumpet. That's what you did to you to you to demand pardon. I said, demand pardon, pourquoi? Est-ce que vous avez la femme d'Aïjo? I mean, the beer? Or is it to tuer sa mère? He said, mais c'est pas possible. Tu m'as cru trompé? He was so angry. Okay, say it in English now. I said, you see, uh, So what did he say? When he, he said, you have deceived me. Okay. I said, deceived you? He said, you told me you were going to write an apology. What you have written here is harsher than what you came in with. I said, yes, why should I make an apology to Paul Beer? For what? Have I slept his wife or killed his mother? Why? Why should I make him an apology? Oh, God, this man could not believe it. Listen, I can't understand this anglo. So he asked them to take me back to the cell. So that's how the third one came out, the, uh, the uh, revolt of Ambazonia. In the meantime, the Dinka riot had um, exploded. Who was rioting? Youth. I was in cell, only hearing about it. Our young men, gangs of young men were going over the place, fighting and breaking places, gendarme, street fighting with gendarme, release from Dinka, release the people's lawyer, release from Dinka, they were shouting around. It went on for weeks. It is the, the police were coming to Maitre, these gens là, they nous a nuit. But who are, it's the Dinkis, no? They were calling them the Dinkis. These boys, I remember, I met one of the... Uh, you know, Ben Muna was the first person to counter-attack me when we produced the new social order. What did he do? He collected the, the names of what he called the Northwestern elite in Yaoundé. They signed their names to denounce me as a lunatic and that I was trying to upset the quiet union and peace that was in the country. I expected at least that this is a lawyer. He understands interpretation of documents. Now, he in fact was outmatched by Fred Ngomba Eko, who was our first indigenous attorney general in Buya. Ngomba Eko organized the what he called Southwest Elite in Yaoundé. And they went out in the streets. He himself led the, the march in the street of Yaoundé there, women in Kabangondo and men in, in, in Sanja, denouncing Dinka. I said, my goodness, these are lawyers. Anyway in the world, this is the best type of thing you can have as a quality of lawyers. These fellows have become so political that they can't even use law to interpret law. My goodness, I say now, this is a case where gold has rusted. And if gold rusts, what shall I undo? Then, to top it all, 
Honorable Salomon Tande Muna took the June session of uh, opening uh, session of uh, Cameroon Parliament as his forum to call for the most severe punishment to be meted on this madman. June of what year? 1985. Call for the severest punishment for my, what he called, my treasonable conduct. And the severest, the, the severest punishment for treason is sentenced, I mean, um, uh, sentenced by, um, to, to uh, death by firing squad. So here where it is the people of our side, this is Amazonian, so-called Anglophone leadership, who took up Paul Bia's fight against me? What What do you think made them do that? I cannot say. Just because they, I mean, as somebody, a, a document called uh, Paul Bia published, uh, I mean, uh, Paul Bia's presidency published, uh, Faces Behind the Mask, uh, by Stephen Tebbit, it states this about the Anglophone leadership. The Anglophone leadership, is a monumental has been a monu monumental failure. It consists of the most unconscionable boot lickers. So that it describes the type of people who are attacking me. Even today, there are now PhDs and so on who are attacking me. Those are the same unconscionable boot lickers. They are licking the boots of Yaoundé. And some of them pretend to be loudest against Yaoundé, but they're still agents of Yaoundé. Because if you're attacking somebody who says our country should be free, who can you be serving? You can only be serving Yaoundé. So, when I saw this, I said, ah! It, is, it made me take a decision that if we are going to get free, it is going to come from outside. And my, our duty was to move from stage to stage and organize a mandate, a legal mandate, which the international, somebody from outside can use and say, I'm coming in, e to, to end this rubbish of you illegally occupying, Cameroon illegally occupying Ambazonia. So that was now our strategy. It's not street demonstration, ghost town, all that is all zero. Cameroon will outmatch you there. They have more resources to outmatch you there when you go political. But when you go by law, they don't have a leg to stand on. So, and it started right there. Because when the Dinka riots exploded, um, one of the people who signed this document, I think it's Governor Achu, he told me when last time I was here, he said, Mbe, these boys came to my office, showed me a copy of what we signed. I said, look, this is George Acho. Is that your signature? He said, he told them I had never seen that document in his life. <laughs> he said, the boys looked like if he did say yes, they would have reduced him to pulp. He said, no, I'm not. Is it a document like that? He said, but this is your name. See, somebody must have written my name and put something there. So they left him alone. Now, it created such problems. They served a document, a, a letter on Muna, Pa Muna, and told him, if you do not reverse your stand, everything that carries the name Muna will be on the other side of this of this grave of the grave. So, these things were going on till about November. The boys were out. The, place was in chaos, total chaos. For weeks, it was in chaos. Schools were closed. In all Ambazonia, even primary schools were closed. So on the 11th of November, 1985, Pamuna made a U-turn. He now took the, the uh, his opening speech for the, uh, for the November parliament used it to denounce, to call for a round table conference where the two countries will sit on a, or discuss this matter on the basis, he says, of mutual equality as it was in Fumban. 
The procedure is that the speech to be made by a speaker must be sent first to the presidency for approval. Can you imagine? Head of the legislature not supposed to talk without approval of the president. He sent it there. They doctored it, removed areas which they didn't want, and sent it back to him. Of course, on the day, he kept that their document that they sent. He knew that his head was, <laughs> there, was some, there was a threat mm -hmm. which could be carried out. You see, there's, some, there's nothing that is evil. Cowardice can be used. Now, this was cowardice now that was making Muna perform the right thing. So, Muna now took the, made this statement there. He read his own speech, he ignored what they had sent to him, and Paul Bia accused him of leading a pro Dinka parliamentary rebellion against his presidency and never spoke to Muna until he retired. Muna tried every opportunity to have to go and talk with the president. No way. So he didn't even have an opportunity to explain himself or apologize. Or Maybe he wanted to, usually, that was double face that they do. He wanted to go and say, look, look at the thing that they gave to me. That, that's why I had to do this, not to do that type of thing. That may be what he tried, but Paul Beer refused to receive him until he retired. Meanwhile, Paul Beer decided that I must be taken to the military tribunal and charged for high treason. That's where they had their first shock. Here they are accused Parliament, uh, Pamuna, of having led a pro Dinka revolt against him. When we went to the military tribunal, they read the charges. Guilty or not guilty, I said not guilty. Did you represent yourself or you had a lawyer? No, I would present it myself. What would I be looking for a lawyer for? Am I not myself a lawyer? Why should I have anybody to represent? I would think they can double cross your lawyer. You get your lawyer to double cross you. Now, but the thing is that it took place in the night, midnight. Because students had heard I was going to a military tribunal and they were prepared to come and disrupt it. So they made sure everybody had gone to bed. At half past 11 in the night, they came and took me. And it was no longer to a military tribunal, some other place. And they say, here is military tribunal. When they asked me to plead, I pleaded not guilty. They asked the prosecution to state his case. The man got up and talked. This man is a subversive element. He's calling for the army to seize power. He's doing so, 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 and so. When he finished, I said, before I answer any question, all that you are accusing me is what I've written. Have I done anything else outside what I have written? They say no. What I have written is to ask Paul Beer to implement the law he has enacted to the letter. If there is a text which says that whoever tells the president of Cameroon to implement Cameroon law has committed an offense, let me see that text. The president of the military tribunal asked the government man to say, yes, do you have a text like that? The man started talking, he said, oh, he said, look, don't tell us about subversion. Here is the first president of the Cameroon Bar, the Batonier, the premier Batonier de Chenou. He has analyzed things according to his, his legal understanding. And he has asked us, is there a text which entitles us to prosecute him here that he had told the president to clear out of Amazonia and limit the, the authority of the Republic of Cameroon to the territorial boundary of the Republic of Cameroon. Is there a text like that? The man said there's no text. So the man told him, the chief will relax. As the other one, what are you for? The man said relax. This one said relax. It means they acquitted and they discharged me. So they took me away. And uh, they paid a taxi. Uh, Biaka paid a taxi. I got to the place there. People were saying, say, Dinka Elibre, Dinka Elibre. They say, what? Military tribunal? You go to military tribunal and get, get free for high treason. So, I myself thought that the presidency must have been uh, party to this, uh, to letting me off. It was not until the following day when I was rearrested 
and they say the president had appealed against the decision. Why do you think, you know, why do you think that that military tribunal was so independent? I cannot say. I don't know. I don't think it's a matter of independence. If you say you are coming to interpret law, eh? so the man says, what is the offense? You are charging me for an offense that does not exist. That's, that was my, what was this, my, there is no offense that exists that a person who has a president to implement the law has committed an offense. So there's no such offense. In fact, I was being, it was a prosecution without a crime. Well, I'm asking that question because if Cameroon is such a facade where the president of the House of Assembly has his speech has to be approved by the presidency, how, meaning that the legislature here is, is subject to the president. Of course. How come the, legis the, the legislature and the, the, the judiciary military tribunal. is independent? No, military tribunal was not independent. It is the hand-picked people there. In fact, they, before you even go to military tribunal, it has been decided what, 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 uh, what, what um, judgment they are going to give. But they, did, they thought I was going to be defending myself mm. and giving my own part of the story. It would have been, they would have then used their decision that you are convicted. But I say, cite me the law which says who tells the president to implement the law of Cameroon has committed an offense. Okay. So there was some reason that came into an environment where we did not expect. Yes. Okay. So they, they themselves found, the way I put the case was not what we give, gave them the opportunity to, to mumble jumble with it. Let me know the law. I am a lawyer. Show me, show me the law. Let me read it. Which says, whoever tells the president of Cameroon to implement Cameroon law has committed an offense. And what offense is it? Let me see the law. So the people, in their own interest, they turn around and ask the government lawyer, can you cite us that law? And when the man said, no, they, how, what, what could they do? To say they're convicting me for an offense that does not exist? So they had to. Acquit me. It's not a matter of independence. The man who discharged them was this man because this man could not produce law. So when I was rearrested the following day and brought back, they said the president had appealed. Huh? Appealed. I said, all right. I got there. They told me, oh, mate, since you had been already acquitted, you will sit, uh, you will sit in the police post instead of going to the cell. I said, look, I am either in the cell or free. So either take me to my cell or let me go home. So the man went and consulted with the presidency, said this man is insisting on getting into the cell. They said I put him back in the cell. So they put him back in the cell. So the problem was the law creating the military tribunal said in a case of high treason there is no appeal against the decision of the military tribunal. This was because before you were taken to military tribunal for high treason, it was assumed and agreed that you will be convicted. And for high treason, once you are convicted, the best you can do is to appeal to the president for clemency, to reduce from sentence of death to life and so on but the law says there is no appeal so it law cannot change because the decision is now an acquittal so the, the president had no alternative but as lawless as he is instead of now implementing the decision of the military tribunal which had acquitted me he took the law into his own hands and clamped me under house arrest, indefinite house arrest. Where was it? where were you supposed to be now? In Yaounde or no? They moved me to Widikum, my hometown. Put me there, and uh, if I was to go anywhere outside Widikum, I must uh, get permission from the police or gendarmes uh, office in Batibo. But. Um, uh, they found some problem with that. Because on one occasion, 
I decided I had to go to Bamenda for a case which involved, I had a case with the SCB that was claiming some money they were owing me. So I met these people, there was a barrier. Uh, the man said, mate, um, you know that you cannot uh, travel without uh, uh, permission from us. I said, from you who? He said, well, there is something in our place that uh, you are under residence over here, house arrest. I said, all right. So I have broken your house arrest. What do you do with that? Are you not supposed to take me to jail? He said, no, you're not supposed to travel. I said, look, I'm giving you two minutes. You either open this gate and let me pass, or I will consider myself arrested and drive to your, to your, uh, to your gendarme post. Ah. The man discussed with his friend, said, look, let us open the gate and say we never saw him. <laughs> so they opened the gate and we drove, I drove with my wife and went to Bamenda. In fact, very unfortunately, the commandant of the area I met in Bamenda, I went and met him. He said, how? He said, how? I said, what is it? He said, how, how, how do you happen to be here? I said, <laughs> I said oh. Am I not supposed to be here? He said, no. I said, all right, when, you, when are you going back? I would like to go back with you. I said, I will let you know when I'm going back. Of course, I never told him. He wanted to take me back and say that he has, he has grabbed me. He has, and then still the, the show that he has been much more diligent than the others. So, <laughs> of course, I drove back by myself. Met the people there. They, they opened the gate quickly for me to pass back. So, <laughs> so everything, everything is everything is sorted out. The man has not gone. He has, he has not even passed here. <laughs> ah, it's interesting. You see, in these things, my dear uh, brother, the only time you become free is when you accept death. When you accept death, you become free. Death. I mean. Uh, uh, fear changes sides. It abandons you and uh, becomes the unfailing ally of your enemy. So I could say whatever I choose because I was no longer afraid of death. Death was gone. I was now like a person, my, my we the company will say that uh, uh, the, uh, the monkey has said that once I have found myself in the bag of the hunter. I'm no longer interested whether they're going to roast me or they're going to put me in banda or whether they're going to uh, uh, stew. It's still see the same death. <laughs> so, what, what, they say, so where I am now, I'm a dead man, so it doesn't matter to me what people want to do with me. <laughs> so, uh, so, then something strange happened i got my driver one driver is a prince from uh, become never seen one person who was as faithful you know this boy was so good that my attachment to him made everybody even my children they want to ask something for me they prefer to ask through Peter. Because if Peter came and asked, I will give it. So, Peter um, uh, I was now told that um, I asked Peter and one boy, member of our church, please, t Peter, go right through to Calabar and ask my leader that I found a way I can I can get out. But I won't, don't want to do anything which is contrary to the will of God. Should I come away? He asked the secretary to write me. Stay where you are. They are on the people are going to give you traveling papers. I said, hey, give me traveling papers. People put under permanent house arrest. So one day, I got a letter from, from Bamenda. I should come up to Bamenda. 
So I went there, and I should bring my former passport, my identity card, and so on. When I got there, I said, but all those things were seized. I don't have any such thing. He said, we have instruction from Yaoundé to give you uh, traveling papers and your wife. I said, all right. So I gave them my passport, my wife's passport, and they prepared me travel documents. My passport and everything. Gave it to me. So I was free now to move. But I hadn't money to move. I was trying to get my money from SCB. Then Justice Anyangwe died. And that was a family friend. I decided to go to Oshie. So I drove to Oshie. And uh, there was a big crowd. Anybody who was anything in the Northwest was there. Even friends from, from, uh, from Nigeria came where he went to university. Now, government had been giving propaganda that Dinka was either blind, there was rumors around the place that I was blind, I was in something, I'd gone insane, and so on. So when uh, this Carlson Anyang, who is a professor of law now in uh, Zambia, announced that um, uh, this thing is affecting my eyes, but not bad, <laughs> announced that uh, for Dinka was going to make a little speech, and then they go and bury, they were making speeches, people were making speeches. So I made a two-minute speech, less than two minutes, purely spiritual speech about death and the transfer of the spirit into somewhere else to other human beings. That was my... And then I question I was querying them was, they would say, everybody came out and said, this is untimely death. I said, when did God tell you this man was supposed to die? God has planned when a man is to going to die, and you come here and say, untimely. Timely how? Which one is timely? When I finished, I didn't know this had revealed that a hero was around whom they had told, told them that was dead. So it was time now to go for, for a reception. Now, I moved from there. I wasn't going for the reception, but the crowd, instead of going for reception, they were coming to where I was. The ministers and governors were totally disenchanted by this. And information went to Yaoundé. This man is out. And the masses are following him. It's just like what happened in the, in the Bible, where they say the people are following Christ. Uh, so, Yaoundé instructed that I should be arrested and brought back there. You are You are only had to be taken away from uh, uh, out of circulation. First, they query, uh, queried Asine. How did you, who gave this man uh, a passport? Asine had to come and ask me, say, how did this, uh, did you apply for a passport? I said, no. He said, but I received instructions from these people in writing. So he copied the thing and sent to them, said, this is, you people who wrote me, say I should give this man a um, passport. They themselves are confounded around. When did we write this thing? These are some of the mysteries around my life. God got them, either he fooled them to write, or God produced that document and sent in their name, and it was working, he gave me the passport. So they say, arrest him and send him to Yaoundé, um, take the, withdraw the passport. So, no, he had asked me to get the, give, me the, give, uh, give him the passport. I said, I'm not giving you the passport. So Yaoundé said, I should be arrested. So I can now quote his name because he's dead. I see they came to my house in the night. He said, I have instructions to arrest you. In your if, house in Widikum? No, in Bamenda. I was in Bamenda. Okay. This was in Bamenda. Okay. I have instructions to arrest you. If I find you here tomorrow, I will arrest you. What other, what other help do you want from a situation like that? So I stepped onto my car. My wife was in Widikum. My rest of the family were there. Nobody knew where I was going. I stepped on my car right through to Limbe. 
got into a managed to get I passed through I had no money, so I passed through um, uh, uh, Dwala, held Arnold Young Bank by the throat. I said, Arnold, I want money. They are coming after me. He said, Ah. He said, I say this, I rest following me now to take me to Yaoundé. And that was on a Saturday. He said, But he has uh, all his money is gone to the bank. He just pulled his uh, drawer, whatever was there, gathered and gave to me. So I took it, went to uh, CDC, my friend Johnny Bangu. I fooled him that I had been uh, arranging to get my son to Ibadan University for something. Now the letter has come and I have only a few days to get there. So I am going. Uh, so I told the wife, I said, this is the key of my car. If unless my mother from the grave comes, nobody else touches this key. Right? Say yes. She was telling me, Papa, you know what she chops me? I said, no, no, no. He said, right, can I package you some food? I said, no, I'm late. Because I didn't know whether the instructions had already been sent to look after me. I took a taxi from there to the fishing fishing port. Took cover somewhere till about 7 in the evening. I was there. I'd taken a nephew of mine plus one brotherhood uh, a member. We went together. We managed. I hired a speedboat through the night and got to Calabar by 12 midnight. There was no light in that speedboat. But they were getting light from the uh, rigs, the offshore rigs. So that's how we crossed over the Ambas Bay to Nigeria. And that's how I became free to be able to talk to you here. Escaped into exile. So that enabled me to sit down and plan how to proceed with this thing. If I had not come out of there, there would have been no way of proceeding. But to say that I really did anything, I can only say I was being used by God because in 1990, uh, we decided that first we were coming across, meeting me and we were discussing. We must now formalize our independence, which has already been restored. There must be a formal document. Uh, there must be a proclamation formalizing it and we filed it at the United Nations. So this was done on the 10th uh, of October 1990. And I flew to the United Nations, got to deposited there on the 27th of uh, October 1990 and um, all it did was to proclaim the formal uh, for, uh, formalizing the restoration of our country with its constitution Southern Cameroon Constitution which becomes the Ambazonia Constitution the only amendment was that in place of the Queen of England an ethnic Ambazonian would be our head of state, and that was I was designated head of head of state, and that's why that document bears my signature. But that was neither here nor there. Anybody else could do that. What has consolidated our position is that in 1992, our operatives, Ambazonian uh, patriots back home, filed that proclamation as annex and uh, as uh, annexure 3a in the high court of cameroon in the case between ambazonia and cameroon how did that happen but how did what happen how i mean how did how was that i'm, I'm trying to get the process how how it became filed okay what happened was this one of our young men who had been released on bail because they had been demonstrating for uh, for federalism. Blaise Berigny, uh came to me. He said, look, can we have arms? <clears throat> I said, what arms? I said, first, I don't deal with arms. I don't even know about arms. He said, look at what is happening. The whole place is agog. We need to fight these people. I said, no. 
there's something better than arms. I can prepare you a case. You get one of the lawyers to file it there. We are going to win that case because the way it will be prepared is that which Cameroon, no Cameroon judge will be allowed to interfere with it until the, the, the Cameroon authorities appear in court and contest what we are saying. We are dragging them to come to court so that the issue will be joined there. So I prepared it. An originating summons plus an affidavit and an order to show cause. Under the system, under that procedure, when you file an order to show cause, the court serves that on the defendant as the court, court orders, asking the defendant to either challenge these orders and get the court to amend or nullify them, or they'll become absolute. So when these orders are served on you, the defendant, they are orders nisi. What's that? Orders unless. Nisi means unless. It's a, unless you are able to show that they should be varied or nullified. So the affidavit and the order to show cause named a date by which Cameroon was either contest or the thing becomes absolute. It was served on the Procureur General. And Cameroon, I believe that they realized the things that were inside there. For example, my military tribunal trial and the outcome of it was inside the affidavit. That was a closely guarded secret that BS military tribunal had upheld our claim that Bia should move from our territory to the other side. Now, if this case was contested in open court, everybody will now get to know that ah, military tribunal has said that uh, Paul Bia is illegally occupying our country. It would be embarrassing. It would be public news, international, and so on. So, for fear of that, they decided, oh, let Ambazonia win. We will see how they are going to take all, uh, push us out of Ambazonia. That is the work of God. That type of arrogance. Let them win. We we'll see how they are going to take us out of here. They didn't know God was giving us a judicial mandate. What did that thing do? Once it became absolute, you can no longer say Von Goji Dinka is not recognized by Paul Beer as the head of state of Ambazonia because he's in the court records. Nor can you say Cameroon is not illegal occupying our country because that is the charge. That Cameroon is illegal occupying our country and that illegal occupation constitutes an act of continuing aggression, which Article 51 of the United Nations entitled any country to come and push them out. So we were now building legal mandates where in, for the liberation of our country, I came to the conclusion it cannot come from within. We must prepare the parameters of law which become mandates for any external intervention to push Paul Beer out. So HCB 2892 was God-given because one part of it, one part of it, which is very devastating, no, not only one, two of them. Two of the, the declarations are there. Let me read that to you. Five. Is on, it was published in Messager. This was, this, uh, the whole case was published in a Douala-based newspaper called Messager. What date? It is uh, February 10, uh, 1993. It says here, and I uh, quote, Public servants, civilian or military, of Ambazonian origin are discharged of the duty of allegiance, obedience, and loyalty which they owe to the Republic of Cameroon and Paul Beer, so they are henceforth 
answerable only to the Republic of Ambazonia and its head of state, Fon Fangum Goji Dinka.